SEO is in a constant state of flux. Rankings change every day. The algorithm is tweaked and improved by Google's engineers on a pretty much daily basis, and it's hard to keep up. Fortunately, your friendly neighborhood ninjas are here to talk about the state of SEO in 2024. The Dojo, a brand new podcast series by Explosion Ninja, is here to turn the latest marketing news and trends into marketing tasks you can follow. I'm Dale. I'm Jess. I'm Tim. And welcome to the Dojo. So the way this works is that each person here will uh, bring up a story that they think is of interest to business owners, marketing managers, marketing directors, and we'll see which is the most important story and we'll turn those into tasks. I'm pretty sure I said tasks the first time and now a task this time. That's fine. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, um, so um, let's get started with Tim. What's your marketing pickle story for this week? So my pick is a uh, search engine journal, which is a sort of trade publication for the SEO industry has released their state of search 2024 um, report, which basically surveys thousands of agency and in-house marketers and gives us a bunch of takeaways about what people are thinking about inside the industry. And what are people thinking about inside the industry, Tim? People are thinking a lot about content strategy. So I went into this thinking there was going to be loads of AI and there is some AI um, in what people are thinking about, but most of it seems to be how people are using generative AI to produce content. And they're not really thinking too much about what the impact of AI is going to be on searchers behavior, particularly with SGE and what the report calls zero click searches. Um, so a lot of the attention in the report and a lot of attention in the industry seems to be about how do we uh, tweak our content strategy, given that Google is more competitive? How do we tr tweak our content strategy based on the helpful content update? But not too many people seem to be thinking about the impact of these zero click searches and the impact of AI on searcher behavior, which was a real surprise to me because I thought this would be a, a more important consideration given how disruptive this could potentially be. Jess, you look like you, you uh, had something to say. There. Hello. <laughs> uh, yeah, I think it is really interesting because I don't know if we're in a little bit of a bubble because we love AI and we think it's really important or if places are trying to find other ways to kind of fight AI by talking about things like content and talking about things like audiences that often perform better if they're made by people and more people focused. You know, we've had this conversation before where we've said to AI, hey, make us an, a customer profile based on this information. And the information it gives you is based off of like nothing. So you're not going to be able to get that same personal experience, but it does... I wonder if it's just people just don't know. They're scared to say what they think you should do with AI because it's so up in the air. We're not like that. We just say it. <laughs> we just want to share our thoughts with the class. But I can understand why in something like a report, they might be more hesitant when it feels like more of an official document, potentially. Mm. Yeah, and, and I do think... Oh, go on, Dale. <laughs> I'm um, speaking in front of, uh, I don't know, a couple hundred agencies next week. So we'll find out what their knowledge of SGE and Google's plans with it are. But when we were, we'd spoke at a couple of events in November last year and found that even marketers and marketing agencies knowledge of SGE and these potential, uh, you know, massive disruptors like zero click search, but also just people searching on chat GPT. It seemed like a lot of people just weren't aware of this at all. And this was completely new news to them, which I think was stunning given that, you know, that the leadership in Google is talking about this stuff a lot and they are really backing it with some very, very strong language. Um, but you know, yeah, maybe like you say, I guess on a daily basis right now, SGE is having very little impact on people's search traffic. This is very much a kind of, we've got to watch how it goes and see when Google rolls it out and then we'll find out what the real impact is. And maybe this survey is just an indication of people being very um, 
focused on the issues that are hitting them right now rather than thinking about what tomorrow or what six months time or what a year's time is going to bring perhaps yeah i think there's also an element of ai fatigue as well that might be baked into it too in terms of there's been a lot of talk about ai and people are like okay it should be it's a new big thing and it's going to interrupt search and it's going to interrupt content creation all those different things i think some people have tried it and had really bad results and you know it's not worked out for them so they have more of a negative out you know um outlook on it and how they see it uh, being brought into their processes then there's the opposite side of people who who aren't really aware of it at all and are kind of scared to touch it um i think that's more it's multifaceted like because you work your way from like top to bottom board directors are like yeah bring it in because i can see the efficiencies and they're really pushing for it the lower down you go people are like i haven't got time to even focus on it let alone re revise everything i thought i knew about seo um in order to actually like okay what do i need to do now search is changing what should i be doing which is you know a great thing that we can come in and support people with that and you know keep them up to date on what's changing but it can be tricky too and then again the further you go you, you go down the content writer's like well i want to use it and it will probably help me in some ways but then they know that the seo team in another department is like don't just use it for everything don't just blanket create loads of content and then we'll get dinged by some a future ranking update which which causes you know a lot of problems and buy by traffic buy by revenue so it, yeah i think there's a bit of fatigue and fear still but also the unpredictability of is sge going to completely you know search generative experience is it going to completely redesign the landscape of search? Well, if you've been following our content for a while, you'll you'll hear that we believe it <laughs> it, it is going to. Um, yes, yeah, so I'm going to move on to your pick, and then we'll come back and decide which story we're going to pull out the tasks from. So, Jess, you have a story to share as well. Yeah, this is kind of based on a bit of a conversation that me and Tim had a few weeks ago when we were tangenting in a meeting, which we're quite good at. Considering I'm a tangent catcher in most <laughs> meetings, I'm not sure that's the best decision. But we sort of started having a bit of back and forth about how water as a, you know, as a bottled drink is such a fascinating concept now in the uk you may be watching from other places but in the uk most places in the uk you can drink your water from a tap so already bottled water is this kind of commodity that is already almost a bit of a luxury item because you can get it at home but then when you actually go and look in the water section of any shop this sounds so boring i promise it isn't and it's there's lessons here for everyone which is why it's so exciting um but when you go to the water section in the supermarket, there's so many choices and they're all different prices and they're all targeted at different people, whether it's just like, you know, as an accessory or because you're a sporty person or because you want your brain power to be pushed by something like smart water, which has electrolytes. But then you have the, this conversation started because Dale likes the branding of a company called Liquid Death, who sell essentially just canned water and i really like them too because i think they're really interesting and essentially all they're selling is water yes okay they sell sparkling water they sell flavored water but at the core of it they're selling water and it just kind of got us thinking about this and i actually did a little bit of research and by research i mean i went on the tesco website and typed in water but tesco's own brand water is 0 0.03 pence per liter whereas smart water well is that yeah 0 0.03 Whereas smart water is 15p. Okay, I think it's three pence. And the smart water is 15 pence. But the smart water is five times the price per 100 mil that just the Tesco own brand water is. Because, and this is where the lesson comes in, they found their thing that makes them special. All they've done, as far as I can tell, is they add some extra electrolytes to it. Now, I'm the person that reaches for smart water if I'm buying bottled water. But there's other water brands, for instance, like Fiji water, which is really, really popular. It's kind of a bit, well, it used to be kind of a bit of a, like a cult thing because they position themselves as, what was it? Natural artisan water or artisan water. And then you have Liquid Death, who their tagline is murder your thirst. And they go for this real like rugged kind of punk rock styling, whereas Fiji is like, 
bright and there's flowers and it's colorful and it tries to go for that luxury and then there's a bunch of other brands that just put mountains on their bottles and that's like their whole brand branding to be like if it's from the mountain you know it's class you know but then you also have just normal branding that's just water and that's it so i don't know this just got me thinking a lot about like how branding or just having that little thing that makes you stand out and have maybe even targeting a niche audience can really help you stand out in a really oversaturated market no no pun intended with the oversaturation but we often frequently frequently get people asking on the live streams well I'm, i want to target an oversaturated niche what do i do and if you're really, your heart is set on targeting that niche, maybe that's where your skills are, maybe you've been doing it for years and now loads of other people are doing it, you can find ways to stand out, whether that's because you're niching down for the artesian water or you're niching down to promote water to punk rockers who, you know, want something a bit different. It just appeals to them. Like, it appeals to me, it appeals to Dale. Like, we both want to buy it because it's different and it's a bit edgy. There's like and it's expensive like i think liquid death is expensive but because it's cool and a bit niche i'm like oh i'd spend the money on that so i can have those nice cans in my house and feel cool when i'm on a call sipping it like dale does makes me quite are you telling me i'm cool that's the first time everyone's ever said i'm cool amazing you're cool dale confirmed cool. live on this live stream but yeah that was kind of just i've just been feeling very passionate about that for a while because I think there's a lot of lessons there. And the last thing I wanted to say about it is it's also proof that you don't have to be the cheapest to succeed. These brands mm -hmm. that we're talking about excitedly aren't the cheapest brands and they know that they're not the cheapest. They know that they can't compete with the supermarket, cheap, cheap, three pence water. So they found a reason to make you want to spend the money on their nice cans or their fancy Fiji water bottles. Or I think there was one called black water, which was just water that had these minerals in that made it black. I used to buy that stuff all the time. Just cause I was like, Oh yeah, that's cool. <laughs> Ridiculous. You know? So yeah, I think it's just a cool topic. That's, that's what no, I have to say about that. <laughs> I agree with you. And I've had two calls in the last uh, couple of days, which, um, which, relate to this so i had one call in which we we're d discussing about targeting and which kind of clients that um you know this particular business should go after and they were trying to talk about okay how do you stand out in a market where the profit margin is really slim so there's, there's very little money profit margin to actually play with and we talked about there's one thing you can do to stand out is to have just a really solid brand that matches with a, a very specific target market um you know so instead of it being insurance for everything it's insurance for for, for moms or in, insurance for oaps or you know and so on um in this case we we're looking at a glasses brand and one of the brands that first came to mind was that they didn't have necessarily a brand that i remembered but like a gimmick that i remembered it was like a thing that they did that others didn't and that's warby parker and warby parker is um, a big us based um in fact i'm not sure if they're, they're outside of the us but they have um glasses that they were one of the first companies that would just send you a box of five glasses you try them all on then you send them back and then they send you yours with your, your prescription in and this was like a really cool gimmick and they didn't have any shops whatsoever and this was like the first kind of dtc this was like 10 years ago so like it was a big thing and they just had like a really cool gimmick that people bought into they were like I, that, I, it's easy to say in a very short advert what it is that they do direct to your doorstep glasses and cheaper and you know and stylish and you know you, all the additional stuff but this thing that makes you stand out so you've got two choices you can either stand out with like a really unique product or service offering that makes you stand out or you can if you have sell a commodity it's got to be brand it's like a feeling you give to people when they have it and do i feel cool when i drink from my liquid death <laughs> can on a on an internal call yeah yeah I do. um <laughs> But the second well, that's what you're buying right because you're not buying the water none of those companies are selling water they're selling the feeling or the the perceived benefit it's all it's amazing it's pure yeah. pure positioning isn't it totally and the second part was like another call today which was talking about how the marketing team does our targeting you know we can talk to the total total addressable market and then there's the service available market and then there's the serviceable obtainable market the whole thing of like everybody 
in your market you could you could sell water to anybody but your specific who you specifically target is that just that audience that people who are you know they want that thing and it, it aligns with who they are so for example with water you could make it specifically for athletes so with your know, electrolytes and all that kind of stuff or people who are like they like flavor, but they want to feel like they're healthy. So you can create a very, like the, the flavored vol Volvic or whatever it's called. There's like, you can create like a, you know, you can be product led or whatever, but you can go the branding route and just be super cool about for just edgy people like myself, clearly. Or you can go down a different route and just have a really cool product. So you could do something to the water to make it exciting and marketable. So that brings me on to normally where I would then ask the guest. We're going to have some guests coming up in the future. We'll ask the guest for their story and then we pick the best one and turn it to task. This week, I want to um, share a kind of not necessarily news myself, but a story, I suppose. No, it's news. So if you're in the UK, you've seen that BrewDog have been once again in the news and once again, not for the best reasons. Um, so they had to announce that they were going to be um, paying below the living wage so there's like in the uk we have something called like the living wage it's like the minimum you need to really survive after like inflation and everything to you know not be struggling from paycheck to paycheck and brew dog have had to say that they're not going to be able to live up to that standard anymore and i was going through the comments and i realized every time i see a post by brew dog the negativity in the comments is always high now, there are a lot of reasons why there's like been documentaries in the UK which have heightened this, but I've been buying BrewDog for quite a long time. I've got shares like through their like their scheme. So I've kind of been an observer of what they do for a long time. And the negativity is just increasing, and increasing, and increasing. I think partially this is to do with like how edgy in inverted commas they've tried to be with some of their PR. I think like there's a bit of a, an issue with being too edgy in their case trying to be punk in name but not in action is that they turn people against them by trying to be too edgy that people are like can you just be serious for a minute and just look after people and pay them well and you know sometimes your marketing your brand can overwhelm people to the point where they turn away from you and the product is actually people will just slag off the product whether they've tasted it or not and it really negatively impacts you and it makes me question whether like from a PR point of view you should be really wise about what kind of PR you know there's like got to be like a ceiling like in our case we do fantastic digital PR about stories about fantastic things that our clients are doing or the data that they have and figuring out that's a really interesting thing more people would love to be aware of that the bit where it's like we hid we've hidden a gold can that isn't actually gold in a thing and or we you know there's a number of different uh negative uh pr campaigns that they've had that it can really damage your brand and there's like a risk factor like you should embrace brand or you should embrace pr but you've also got to be wary and do like risks and limitations like you know while the risk factors involved and decide whether that is the best fit for you so that's my story for this week, but I'm not going to pick my own. So, yeah, I, I like that. that. I just want to clarify as well that by them dropping from the living wage. So in the UK, we have two separate things. There's the minimum wage, which is the legal minimum you can pay people. And then there's a living wage, which is realistically how much you need to be paid to be like a bit more comfortable. And so the issue with BrewDog that I find is that they started off and it's fine to change. It's fine to grow and develop. That's fine. But they've always been with this like amazing employer that we don't like how other beer companies do things. So we're going to be the ones who shake things up. We're going to take care of our employees because those other beer companies, they don't do that. We're amazing. We do this. And then they don't do that or they go back on their promises. And especially in today's climate, being seen to be doing less for your staff is in really, really poor taste. And people who are fans of the brand, like there'll be plenty of people out there who buy BrewDog who just don't care. They buy it because it tastes nice. That's it. They don't care about any of the PR. They don't care about any of that stuff. But there are the hardcore fan base who really, really are invested in the product, you know, and they really care. It's like, for instance, a massive part of Liquid Death, for example, is that they put their drinks in aluminium cans 
because or aluminum for our American friends out there. My dad hates it when I say that. So I just thought I'd make a point. Um, but if they started all of a sudden selling loads of single use plastic products on their store, let's say, or doing a promotion at an event that was really environmentally unfriendly or if they would like did a massive bonfire I don't know I'm trying to think of some environmentally unfriendly things then people would be like we really don't like you for that because that doesn't go with our values at all and they would start to that core fan base who buys the $60 hoodies that I saw on their website today and who buys those like high ticket items that are out like those little add-ons are gonna fall away and then the brand slowly is going to fall away. Like I used to think of Brewdog as like, you know, I would buy Brewdog for friends who like beer. Now I would not. I would not go near it because I just think, like I saw friends sharing when you said about that story earlier, Dale, I was like, oh, I think our stories might be different. But no, it's the same story. And I've seen friends sharing about it. And it really tarnishes the brand. And what we're, I think I'm very long-windedly saying is that if you have these values and you build your whole business on that and you say, we are X, Y, and Z, and then you're not, it looks it looks really bad. And that actually ties nicely into my story because one thing that I forgot to mention was that we're obviously talking about water and stuff. We're talking about Brewdog being kind of punk. But let's say you genuinely have the best customer service in your industry or your software is the fastest. If then people call you and they get a really rude person on the line or they can never get in touch with a service operator, that's a lie and you can't just do that. And I think that's people are feeling betrayed by Brewdog. I think that's what it is. They feel like they invested in an ideal and that they've been putting their money towards a company that shared their ideals. And now they feel like this company's going, actually, we were faking that and now we're not doing that anymore. So, yeah. And I wonder, has the price of Brewdog changed? If they're paying people less, is the price of the beer going down? I expect not. I expect it's probably going to go up, right? So, yeah, it's, it's yeah, that's my thoughts on that. Sorry, Tim, would you like to say anything? I feel like I've dominated this podcast so far. <laughs> No, no, it's not. I, I mean, I think it's exactly what you said. It's about consistency, isn't it? And the dangers of, particularly with a younger audience today, and by younger, I mean sort of Gen Z and coming up into the bottom end of millennial. If you're thinking, oh, we can, you know, oh, let's just champion our eco credentials or our ethical credentials as a bit of a marketing stunt, you've got to be really careful because unless that's actually baked into the DNA of your company, and unless you're making every decision through that framework, it's only a matter of time before you slip. And like you said, Jess, about if, you're, if your USP is that you've got great customer service, all it takes is for the customer to have one bad experience with a customer service agent that just had a really bad day or came off a bad call. And all of a sudden that identity that you've invested a whole bunch of marketing dollars and time into building is gone and it's the same danger here with Brewdog where yes they've been a bit punk but they've also tried to play the you know we're ethical card and the trouble is that that inevitably brings greater scrutiny when you have to make tough business decisions you know their input costs are going to be massively higher than they were previously they need to keep sales up so they can't increase their prices by too much so they're under real business pressure but of course that means that when you make an announcement like this you're going to get way more scrutiny than you were previously so it's really difficult and you've just got to be you got to pick your positioning carefully haven't you and make sure it's actually real and it's not just you're just not just trying to put a layer of marketing sheen over it to tick mm -hmm. some boxes for a gen z audience yeah, that's a really interesting one about marketing sheen because, of course, there were press releases related to this and that they've announced it, uh, Brewdog announcing that they're not going to be able to keep up with the living wage. Um, they could say that we can't keep up with that, and if we did, we'd have to let people go in order to pay everyone. We wanted, we'd rather keep people in yeah. jobs, therefore we can't afford to raise everybody's uh, you know, pay rates. Um, I think people would prefer to keep their jobs than to lose them. So they could have gone on and talked about that but then there's the danger of it being seen in the wrong way of like okay well now you're just trying to talk about how great you are oh yeah and we're really great and we're just keeping people in jobs so like people could still react badly to that um yeah my guess is hr would have said you can't say that in case we have to let people go anyway and then we look really bad yeah it's a really really good trick yeah, I'd love to see the press release because this is one thing with Brewdog is they've made announcements in the past and they've really had an attitude about it. Like we're paying everybody a living wage or like they'll be like, yeah. oh, we're cutting everybody's prices. Do you want the company to die? Because the company will die if we don't do that. You know, that's kind of I'm not saying that's what they've said. This is just me 
riffing off the, the way that they've come about in the past when they've made announcements like this. Um, but yeah, it can be a bit like, we're making this decision and we're the only ones who are right. And if you don't agree with us, you are bad. And actually, if you come at it from a place of love, like there's a small business I know that had to let all their staff go and they were lovely about it. They were really kind. They were like, this has been the hardest decision I've had to make. And I know it's a lot more personal when it's a small business, but it really made me think like, oh, bless them. I feel really awful for them. And mm. I can tell that they've had this decision has really, really hurt them. And I think having that kind of personal element and it coming from a person rather than a press release and kind of having that, you know, more, I don't know, human element to it can really yeah. make all the difference. So yeah, I'm yeah. going to go and read that press release afterwards because I'm quite intrigued to see how they handled it. I'm going to take on to, sorry, please. I'm going to pick our winner. No, you're not. If that's right. <laughs> no, I'm not. All right. <laughs> no, I believe we're probably going to pick the same one. So let's wait and see. We'll move on to the next right. section. But before we do, uh, I'm just going to tell you a little about, about the uh, the company that's bringing you today's the dojo. So Excited. here we go. <laughs> Uh, the Dojo is produced by Exposure Ninja, an industry-leading digital marketing agency delivering high ROI marketing campaigns to businesses around the world. If you want a taste of the high ROI marketing that we deliver for your business, then request a free marketing and website review done by our team of friendly ninjas. Our team will record a video review of your marketing and will highlight the ways in which we can get you, get you more from your marketing. I was doing so well. You can request your review by going to explosioninja.com forward slash review, and you should see that review within a couple of working days. Going to bring everyone back now. <laughs> Where have you gone? There you are. So the next stage of this is to pick a winner, and then we'll turn the winning story into tasks that you as a marketing manager, director, or business owner can implement. So the best story from the three that we've had it's actually a combination of two. So I think that the best, the best story from this is the water story and the brew dog story, because I think there's a lot more that we can take from this. <laughs> Thank you, Jess, um, for, for both marketing managers and business owners, because I think there's a lot of lessons here. So I'm going to start with you, Jess, if you don't mind. Which tasks or what tasks do you think marketing managers can take from your story? I think if even if you're not in an, in an oversaturated industry, but especially if you are, I think you should really look at what makes you stand out. What is it that's different about you compared to your competitors? Because it's very easy to just say, this is what we've always done and it's worked or say, well, everybody does this, you know, or people don't care about that. As the water conversation has showed, they really do care about that. And there's all these little micro things that impact people that mean that they then want to buy from you. And so I think that is, that's the key lesson that I would take away from here. And also, I suppose if you're in the early stages, or actually, even if your business has been going for a bit longer, figure out what it is that you could maybe add to your products to make them stand out or what you could highlight that you already have. Like I said, things like amazing customer service and to bring this to more of a B2B stance, like maybe you have, you know, the fastest software or the best software and you have credentials to show that maybe you've won a bunch of awards but you're not really using that to the best of your ability so I think that's the main thing for me is that you should review your offering and figure out ways to either add to it which will kind of come more into the business owner and director kind of side of things but if you can find ways to highlight your product or your service in a different way yeah, I'm going to push you a little bit more on this one because I think you've tapped into something really important in terms mm. of like you have to review your offering and making sure that it's in line with what the, the market wants. But I think that also creates an additional conversation that is perhaps more long term. So, for example, if Jess, you were to go and speak to Tim about our product offering, our service offering and said, OK, we want to improve this because this is what we believe the market wants. That conversation is not going to be in a 24 hour thing. It's going to take longer. There's going to be more people to be involved. What do you think are some like tasks that can be done right today within a 15 minutes or an hour or just, you know, at the end of the day, something somebody could do? And whilst you're answering that, I'm going to go answer the door. Excellent. Classic. We love it. We didn't hear a doorbell. We love a doorbell, me and Tim, on this podcast. I switched mine We do off love beforehand. a good doorbell, don't we? I'm I am trying to think about something that you could do before the end of the day 
that would in 15 minutes that would would change this and I don't know if it is about reviewing your niche and your positioning and just getting that started reviewing your audience you don't need to go and make all these changes right away you just need to review what's already there and what you've got and that's the first thing because you can't go to somebody more senior and say right I think we need to change everything based on nothing (laughs) so it's really important to review the data whether that's you know data from external sources or whether that's your own data speak to customers find out a bit about what makes them tick and why they came to you because there might be something that you didn't really think was that important for instance you might say like you're a family-run business and think nobody really cares about that actually a lot of people do care about it so there's all these different little things that are every day to you but are brand new or special to other people really i love that qualitative and quantitative you know, argument of, you know, I've got like some experience I can bring from from talking to people but I've also got the data of sorry uh, <laughs> the data to back it up like I believe this to be the case I spoke to this customer they said this oh and by the way this is what the data shows as well it really helps your uh, helps your argument Tim I hope we picked the same story did we pick the same story yeah we did yeah yeah I thought I thought just the thing is great because it's pure marketing right and it was making me think I don't know if you've um there's a book called Blue Ocean Strategy, which is which is is pretty interesting book, and it made me think about all these water brands and how water is such a perfect market to analyze as a thought experiment because we all understand the product, and we can all understand these the sort of different audiences. I was doing due diligence on an acquisition before Christmas, and what I did is plot them against all of their competitors. So I got all of the competitors in a list, um, and then I worked out what their sort of different selling points were in, in this industry. So, uh, you know, price or the, the quality of the thing that they're offering or speed, and then worked out which areas each competitor was emphasizing. And what that gives you is a, a kind of a scatter plot, I guess, about, um, you know, so say it's water, you might have a you might have a thing for health, you might have a thing for brain power, you might have a thing for cool factor, and work out which one each of these brands is scoring against. So you almost end up with like a baseball card scoring thing for each of these brands. And then it would be really interesting to do the same for your industry to see, you know, how do your competitors position themselves? Because a lot of this actually isn't about the features or benefits of the product. It's actually about that kind of intangible stuff. So you might end up with things like feeling of cool, like for liquid death, there's no features there. It's just a it's a feeling, it's a, an audience sort of identification, it's like an identity play. Um, and it might just be interesting to see where you stack against your competitors. We were doing some uh, sort of branding and positioning work at the start of last year, and we worked with a client who was pretty, I'd say, generic in their space. Um, but talking to them, we realized actually that they did really well with a particular type of customer. They were the sort of liquid death of their industry. Um, they did really well with gamers, um, but they didn't really emphasize that too much on their on their website. Their website had actually tried to make them a bit more generic, a bit more like the sort of the Tesco water, which doesn't really have any position other than price. And we sort of pushed them to be a little bit bolder and go after that audience more specifically. And I think that was a, that made a big difference for them. Um, but it actually didn't cost them anything to do that. And that's the great thing about a lot of this stuff is it's just it's just tweaking a bit of messaging here and there, maybe tweaking some look and feel stuff. And uh, you get the benefits. Someone's just started trying to break through the door with a chainsaw. So I'm going to meet myself. But yeah, go and plot yourself. <laughs> Superb. Well, whilst Tim takes care of that uh, noise issue, um, I'm just going to highlight that the cost of liquid death per 100 mil is 0.28 pence. So 28 pence, which is huge compared to the 0.3 pence or whatever it was for Tesco water, you are buying brand. You are essentially buying brand. There is extra stuff in there flavoring, but you are buying brand. And I don't care because I love it. (laughs) I enjoy it. And that's what matters. Um, Super. So before we move on to the next bit, um, uh, I would ask our guests some uh, quick fire questions. But this week, I'm going to ask you, Jess, if you don't mind terribly. Of course. I actually interrupted Tim to answer one of his questions last week, which is quite funny because now, Tim, feel free to interrupt me. If, just just do it for sake. Just say things that don't even matter if you'd like. <laughs> Love it. In that case, let's go. That's my strategy. 
<laughs> Interrupt me, not Dale. They did nothing wrong. <laughs> okay, here we go again. If you had just one hour to improve your marketing, what would you work on? This is the one I interrupted last week. And so I've got to say something different now. I was looking at this like, oh, I really set myself up for failure there. But I think especially based on our conversation today, it would be to look at your niche and your positioning and just make sure that everything you're doing really is, really does embody your business and would actually inspire somebody to buy from you over a competitor. So it could actually be, I'm going to steal from Tim, do Tim's little scorecard thing, because that was really cool and a really good idea. And it gives you a great idea of what your competitors are promoting, what things really make them stand out. And then you can see if you are standing out in that market as well. It's really important. Thanks for that idea, Tim. Much appreciated. What would you do with an infinite marketing budget? We actually had this conversation the other day and it was to do with sort of targeting different audiences on YouTube. And I said that if I could do whatever I wanted with the YouTube channel is that I'd have it almost like a choose your own adventure where we have a topic, let's say like SEO optimization. And then we have one video that's like, today we're talking about SEO optimization. If you're brand new to SEO, click here. If you're an SEO pro, click here. And it takes you to two separate videos that cover the same topic, but in different kind of way. So one will be more standard and one would be more advanced. And yeah, basically what I'm saying is that I would identify two different audiences, cold audience and maybe a warm audience who are more at the level of being ready to purchase and then find two different ways to target them. It's not Love really it. that exciting, but I'm quite pleased with that. Or the other thing yeah, that came right. to mind is I do a Super Bowl ad because everybody talks about them and they're wild. So that's the, that's the second one. What's your favorite Super Bowl ad? I don't actually know how to answer that question. I can't really remember any, but I know when they, when it happens, I'm like, ah, oh, yeah, everybody's talking about these adverts. I have to say I hated it because it's crypto, but the Coinbase ad where it was like bouncing around the screen, that was yeah. really clever because it played into a, like pop culture where people are obsessed with that thing, like bouncing around the screen and being like, oh, remember when you were in school or like when you were at home and you were waiting for that DVD thing to go into the corner? It never did. But when it did, it was amazing. <laughs> they really played into that. And they also played into the interactivity um yeah so yeah but i just hate it because it's cryptocurrency and it's a scam anyway that will open a can of worms next question that was my favorite one as well never mind um <laughs> okay uh which marketing skill would you recommend that the 18 year old jess works on and why oh i think maybe um taking accountability for more stuff i think is really really important this is kind of a thing in any job but I think it can really play into marketing as well because you have so many decisions that you make on a daily basis and you have to test so much stuff and reiterate and do things and make decisions and sometimes it can be it you do have to take risks that just don't pay off and I think it's important to be able to take responsibility for those but also to still take those risks and be willing mm. to try out new things I think that's what I would advise 18 year old me working in influencer marketing no i wasn't i was at university ignore me i was doing journalism so <laughs> it doesn't really count but yeah that's great what are you most excited about in marketing right now oh i think i'm really excited about ai still i'm really excited about sge which i know a lot of people aren't but i'm really excited about it from like a consumer point of view to be able to get that really personalized experience. And because I'm excited about it from a consumer point of view, I also want to share that excitement with marketers because I think there's so much possibility and there's a real chance to like, not just do the same old stuff, to really try and get really creative with how we're targeting that search. And it's just always exciting when something new and different happens in, especially in a industry where things have been not necessarily the same, but a lot of things that applied 10 years ago can still apply now. In that case, I'm going to move on to the last question, which is who should we invite to be the next podcast guest? Ooh. If we could pick anyone, I would like to speak to Mr. Beast because I think he does some really I interesting you were going to say Mr. Bean. <laughs> Not Mr. Bean. 
Why would I say Mr. Bean, Dale? Mr. Beast. The way, the way it was coming out, it's how long you're going to say Mr. Bean. I pronounced it. No, Mr. Beast. That, right. Because there's a bunch of different stuff that he does that's really, really interesting in terms of not only how he positions his YouTube, but also the stuff he does on the outside. For instance, the Feastables chocolate bars and like Mr. Beast Burger, like all this stuff. I'm very, very interested in that whole, that whole shtick really yes i panicked then i didn't really know who to say it he always comes into my mind when we're talking about marketing mm. so mr <laughs> mr beans is the answer <laughs> okay that's cool i'll see what i can do is there anybody else slightly more within my reach that you would like me to, to try and speak to i don't know you can even Sorry. pick one of our fantastic ninjas from the dojo if you like oh we have a really great content ninja called carl who does some really cool content stuff and who's really switched on with AI and content. I would think he could be quite fun to come on the podcast. Superb. Great. Invite out uh, to Carl very shortly. Well, uh, thank you very much for joining the second episode of the dojo. Really hope that you've been able to take some uh, tasks away that you'll be able to implement today if not by the end of this week. And if not, tune in next week for the next episode of the dojo for more things to listen to whilst you're implementing the tasks. It's been a pleasure. See you next week for the next episode. Take care and uh, see you later.